Praise God. It's good to be with everyone again this evening. It's Thursday evening. Uh, uh, August the 13th. Uh, just want to welcome everyone. Good to see you, Sister McGowan. I hope you're feeling better. I'm sorry I haven't called you this week to check on you. I've been praying for you. Anyway, I um, appreciate everyone. Uh, I may first start off with uh, some, just a little bit of announcements. Uh, I think most everyone does know that Brother Ken Jacoby did pass away with coronavirus in Tyler, Texas. His, um, his funeral is tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, I believe. But Brother Kennedy is asking that uh, the funeral be held for the local saints since, uh, since they're required to have uh, adequate spacing and uh, so he knew Brother Jacoby is so so well loved in the body of Christ that there would be in fact I considered going myself but I didn't think about the spacing and and all but according to his post uh, Brother Kennedy asked that you know we, we, we leave that room for the local church families since he was so respected and honored there locally Anyway, we pray for Brother Jacoby's family and comfort of those that were his loved ones and uh, pray for the church there. It's, it's a great loss to, to them and also it's a great loss to Haiti. Brother Jacoby was a great help to Brother Kennedy and especially in building and making many trips to Haiti, helping that work over there. So, And then mentioning Haiti, <clears throat> a great loss there, Brother Preval long time uh, leader uh, of the, of the uh, ministry over there in the uh, in the land of Haiti and uh, had many many churches under him and of course uh, was really one of the very chief men over there for many years now they're bearing him uh, the 20 I believe the 28th of uh, which would be a week from this I believe it's a week from this Friday that he's going to be buried there in Pernalis, Haiti. So our prayers are certainly with Haiti and the churches over there and the, the, the ministry and his churches, of course, and his family. We, we, it's a great loss over there to lose him. Um, they're also burying Brother... Uh, memorial service for, for Brother Oates in, in Godfrey. He's, he passed away last, last month, I believe it was, but they're just now having his memorial service. My wife would know the date on that, but I don't go off the bat. Anyway, continue to pray for Sister Oates and her comfort in the Lord's help as she adjusts her life there without Brother Oates. He was in our assembly here in Little Rock and, and also in Springfield, Missouri for many years and so uh, we certainly, it's certainly lost to all of us. Anyway, uh, I just wanted to mention those things. Uh, uh, <clears throat> and though the local church here, please remember uh, that uh, we're having a work day in the church Saturday, Saturday morning at eight o'clock. Uh, just gonna try to get started while it's still cool and, and get a few things accomplished for a few morning hours. And so I appreciate all the men and young men and older men as well to come and help us get these things that need to be done accomplished. Um, also, I'm hoping that some of the sisters will come and we, we, it would really help us, some of the sisters would come and help us get a real good cleaning of the church tomorrow morning. I did not announce that last Sunday, so uh, if it's kind of late for that announcement, we'll, we'll understand. But if, if you can, some of your sisters can get together and come, it'll sure be a, a great blessing. Anyway, <clears throat> God bless you all. Uh, uh, I, may, uh, I might say a few things tonight about the book of Hebrews. Uh, uh, I've, I've talked on this in our local assembly before, but... Uh, I just thought maybe I might reiterate a few things that I think are very important. 
about the book of Hebrews. <clears throat> uh, first off, if you'll notice uh, in the first chapter, I'll give you a moment to get your Bibles and, and uh, turn to the first chapter of the book of Hebrews. Excuse me while I get a drink. I'm, I've been running this afternoon. I just barely got was able to get online in time here tonight, and, and I'm having a lot of trouble with this uh, new Facebook page of how how to figure out how to get on live. Every it's it's like a nightmare every time. I just work for minutes and minutes trying to get on. Sister Smith helped me tonight to finally get it get online. I appreciate her help. Anyway, Sister Anna Nelson asked us to please pray for her. So keep her in your prayers, Anna Nelson. All right. <clears throat> um, in Hebrews, the first chapter, I'll just, I'll just read a little bit. It says, God, who at sundry times and in divers' manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Um, just notice that he said here, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. I, I just want to remind you that almost every scripture that in the New Testament that refers to the last days are the end of time. End, end of time, last days, is almost always referring referring to the end of that world back there, not the end of this world. So uh, that's important to remember uh, because a lot of times people read about the last days and they think it's talking about down here. It's not. It's talking about their last days and the end of that Jewish world. It's so important to understand that there is two worlds the Jewish world, well, actually there's three worlds, the antediluvian world, the world before the flood, then the Jewish world, and then the Gentile world. And so the Jewish world ended up in A.D. 70 after God harvested that world. By the way, there's two harvests also. I mentioned that Sunday morning that uh, I'm just showing, or maybe it was Sunday before last, on the harvest that it was always harvest time. It was harvest time when when uh, uh, Joshua took the children across uh, Jordan. Jordan had overswelled her banks and because it was harvest time, in other words, the, the spring rains, the latter rains had fell in the spring of the year. They are called the latter rains. It's just the opposite of what we think of when we think about our seasons, we think about our early rains being in the spring because our year starts in January. Their, their agricultural years, uh, Israel had, had two calendars. They had a, a religious calendar, a spiritual calendar, and a, a agriculture or a civil calendar. That calendar started in October of the year and went through October the following year. And so their early rains started in uh, October. Late is either late September or October because their calendar was different a little bit in ours. So it, it can overflow depending on what year it is, whether or not it's actually in the end of September or the beginning of October. Um, and so uh, their early rain starts as their fall rains after the end of their harvest year. See, harvest, I'll, I'll explain this to you. Their harvest starts, I'm, I'm going to do I'm going to say it this way. The, in the end of their harvest, it's just like ours. In the end of our fall, we're done with the harvest. Winter's going to set in, Okay. So what they do is they plow their fields, they plant new barley and new wheat in the fall of the year after the harvest is over. And they and they plant new seed for the following for the for that next year. Then the fall rains fall, and that's called the the early rains. And the early rains 
fall, uh, fall in the fall, and the seeds will come up and grow down through the winter, but none of it, nothing's ready for harvest down through the winter. That's why I have a little bit of a hard time, well, not just a little bit, a lot of hard time, understanding that there's anything can be done during the Dark Ages, which is a type Paul planted in the fall of the year. He planted in the Gentiles. See, he planted after the harvest of the Jews, he planted the Gentile world. And here we are, the first thing happened to us, we went through the dark ages of the Gentiles after God finished the harvest of the Jewish world. And so all down through the dark ages was like a winter. Remember in the Songs of Solomon, remember what it says? It says, uh, the time of the turtle has come. Let's talk about the turtle dove the, in the spring. And the winter is over, it says. And so the end of the year uh, takes place. And, and like I said, the barley and wheat will come up. I'm a, I was a farmer and raised, you know, in the country. And so I understand how that, you know, you can plant barley, you can plant oats, you can plant wheat. It'll come up and it, it'll even help your cattle can graze it. It'll grow some, especially on warmer days in the winter but it won't grow during the cold days. And it's certainly not gonna to come to a harvest. It'll take the spring to finally be ushered in. And listen to this. The reason that it's winter and cold is because the sun is further away from the earth. That's how our seasons are determined. The sun in its orbit and uh, it, it, it's further away from the earth. And that's a picture. The sun is a picture of Christ. Christ he comes close during harvest time. In other words, there is a time. There's a time and a season in all things. And there's a time for restored church. There's a time for harvest of spiritual things as well as natural things. And so the latter rains fall in what we would call uh, April, March or late March or April. And and that's when Israel had their barley and wheat harvest. And that started the harvest after the latter rains fell. And so we're waiting on our latter rains. We're waiting. We had our early rains when Paul planted this among the Gentiles. He sowed seed. It, it, there was rain upon it. And uh, this gospel went out into all the Gentile world. It's a 2,000 year world. And we're coming up to a restored church because it's coming harvest time and the latter rain is going to fall. And naturally, the, the barley and wheat harvest starts out the harvest, but then you have the figs, you have the grapes, you have the olive berries, the nuts, you, you have all your fruits that grow all year long, all spring, all summer, there's two seasons of grapes. There's two seasons of figs. Uh, the nuts grow all summer long. Uh, the olive trees produce olives. It, uh, it goes all the way until the fall, until finally the harvest is over and, and the fall comes in and all, everything is, all the fields are plowed up and new seed is planted for the next year. And that starts again, the early rains for that next year. Anyway, that's the end of the world <clears throat> where we, we are coming into, you know, our world has went through all the winter time. The winter's over, the, the, the turtle dove, the restored church, the spirit of God. That's the turtle dove's a picture of the spirit of God. It's coming in a greater form than we've ever known or ever seen it. The Gentile world has never seen yet the move of God that the end of the Jewish world saw but we will see it. We'll see it in the restored church. It will produce overcomers. It will produce everything that early church produced. We're going back into a garden condition. It's like the book of Joel said. The book of Joel said that, uh, that they're never the second chapter. It said, blow the trumpet in Zion for the day of the Lord. Is, is upon us. It's a, the time. It's that time. 
It said there's a strong people that never has been a people like this, neither shall be for many years. And that's the indication that there wouldn't be anybody like the early church, divine order of God from the day of Pentecost till the harvest was over in AD 70. There would never be another people like that for many generations. <clears throat> That's us. After many generations, there's going to be another people like that, another people that the world's never seen nothing like it. Sometimes it's hard to fathom because we've never seen anything like it. We read about it in the New Testament, but we've never saw it. We've seen some great moves of God. We felt great operation of God. Of course we have because the church would die if God didn't visit us and help us along the way. But he wasn't ready yet to bring us to a full judgment. Let me say something about judgment. God's judgment is a good judgment. It's not, you know, we look at judgment like, you know, dear Lord, we have to go to court and stand before a judge and what a profound guilty. God's judgment is not like that. It's a progressive judgment. Listen, this judgment is, it's first, it's informative. When you come to God, there is much information for you to receive. You are to be, you, you first have to know and hear the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And you have to have faith. You can't have faith without God's help. Jesus said, no man cometh unto me except my father draws him. So, God, God has to deal with you for you to even come to God. God has to give you faith. And the way that happens is, number one, God has to have a way to deal with you. That's why many, many of us, um, you know, we have to be exposed to God some way. God has to have a way to deal with us. Most of us are dealt with through we're, we either have family, we've got, you know, mothers and fathers, grandfathers, grandmothers, aunts and uncles. Someone had God in their life that influenced our life. Uh, I was raised, I was just raised a church brat. You know, I was, my, my mother was a Holy Ghost, Pentecostal woman. She kept me in church. She, she, we all went to church. I didn't, I didn't get to choose. I had to go. I was made to go. That's, I was the most blessed child that I had the exposure to the wonderful spirit of God and the word of God. I know I felt the spirit of God. I don't remember it, but I know I felt the spirit of God in my mother's womb. My mother was a Holy Ghost woman. She was faithful to God. Many of the saints that's been under my ministry for many years now, have, you know, many of the women have had their babies in church. They, they, they became, you know, they were with child and they were pregnant with child in church. I've seen many of them get many, blessed many times in the Holy Ghost. That child in their room, remember how John the Baptist, when he was in Elizabeth's womb, when Mary told her about her visitation from the angel and told her she would, was gonna have a child, a virgin birth. And that child leaped in Elizabeth's womb. She felt the Holy Ghost. That child felt the Holy Ghost in its mother's womb. Well, how blessed can a child be to feel God's spirit while he's still yet in his mother's womb? And, you know, so that child is blessed among all children because God has a way to deal with that child through that mother. The Spirit of God touched it. Something it may not have been able to relate or understand what it's all about, but it was the first influence of God's Spirit touching its life. And so, uh, however God has a way to deal with you, but uh, then if God doesn't deal with you through a person, he may deal with you through a man of God, a preacher, 
a, a gifted man of God. There's something that people really need to have an understanding of is that men, God's men that are have a gift in the ministry, either an apostle, a prophet, a teacher, a pastor, or an evangelist, the five full ministry of God, the hand of the Lord. That's what the fingers on the hand naturally represent God's gifted ministry. God does that. Man can, you can't choose. You can, you don't choose to be a minister. You have to, God has to, uh, you have to receive that gift from the Lord. And I'll tell you how I, how, I, how he receives it. Just like a little baby, a little baby is born, whether it's a man or girl, whatever. When you're born, you're, gift, you're born with gifts and talents. If you're a musician, it'll show up in your life sooner or later. If you're an artist, it will show up in your life sooner or later. If you are a carpenter, it will show up in your life. If you are, you know, whatever your gift is in life, it will show up. Your gift, it will just go to work in you. I've often told, you know, about two little boys that was in my church many years back, and they were friends. Their parents were friends. They spent a lot of time to each other. Those parents would go over to one another's house, or a lot of times they would keep one another's killed children, babysit them, you know. And those little boys, one of those little boys was, he loved Legos. These little Legos, he could sit for hours and just build with those little Legos, putting them together and making different buildings that just, that just satisfied his mind. His gift was in that. He loved that. By the way, that boy is a, he's a cabinet maker and a trim carpenter today. He, he, that's his gift. He loves that. The other boy, he would, he, he would play with him for a while, but in a little while, he'd go outside. He'd get him a hammer. He'd, build, he'd, he'd, he'd pull a nail out of a board or take a nail and beat it into a tree, or he'd get to, you know, doing something else. He's a carpenter today, but he's a different kind of carpenter than the other boy. Those boys' gifts showed up. And uh, if, if fathers are, are, are keen enough and wise enough, they'll watch for their children to see what, what their gifts are. And they will help those children develop those gifts. And you cannot, so many fathers make mistakes trying to live their life and their desires through their children. I've seen fathers you know, try to beat their children into being good basketball players, good football players, or baseball players, or whatever. You know, when their kids had, they didn't have no gift for that. They didn't have a talent in that. But the father maybe did, or that was what the father, and the father wanted to live through the child. Uh, it is true sometimes that children do take on similar gifts and traits that their fathers have because their fathers can influence them, help them develop. You know, if, if your father's a carpenter, you're probably going to learn to do some carpentry. And, uh, you know, it's just like, did you ever notice in the Bible that God had the Levitical tribe, he chose them to be in the priesthood. They were all priests. And you'll see that today a lot. You'll see a lot of men that are, are ministers uh, that their children, their sons become ministers. Their wives will marry ministers a lot of times because they've lived their entire life looking at the church from the inside out. And that's just the way it works. God works in natural ways uh, with uh, to accomplish spiritual means many times. Anyway, uh, so... What I was going to say to you was, is this, the ministry, always remember that even though a man who is a gifted ministry has a call to the ministry, here's what I was going to tell you is that just like a baby in the natural has gifts and talents in the natural, when you're born again of the spirit of God, that's when you get your gift, you know. Everyone is gifted individually. 
And if you have a ministerial gift, you'll get that gift when you're born of the Holy Ghost. When you're born again, you'll, you will have a gift. Uh, uh, you know, the Spirit of God may work, uh, you know, I could say this, even before you're born again, you are impregnated with the Word of God. If you, you know, if you repent to the Lord, God deals with you, God's dealing with you, that seed can be there. But until it comes forth, it's never going to produce what it would produce in a full talent and gift. So but what I was going to say to you is these men don't ever forget just because they're natural men. I had a girl work for me one time. She said she had a very difficult time changing hats. She, she worked for me in the natural, and then I was her pastor. She couldn't take that, that I was an authoritative man on the job, uh, I, I took that hat off and became a pastor, you know, and sometimes it interchanged, you know, because sometimes I had to be a pastor on the job for people who worked for me that was in the church. But some people have a hard time with that, recognizing this man's a natural man, but he has a gift. And when that gift of God goes to work in him, you need to realize God's dealing. He's working through that man in that gift by the spirit of God. And that is to feed and help the people of God. And so don't ever get to looking at the ministry. I had a man one time, you know, he made a statement to me. He said, I could be a pastor. You know, I don't see, I don't think I'd have a problem being a pastor. I thought to myself, what? You're not a gifted pastor. I, I know something about gifts. You don't have the gift of a pastor. You may be an elder. You may have a gift in the ministry and a help in the ministry, but you don't have a gift to pastor a church. You know, so uh, sometimes I get to thinking, people think this, you know, you just in the natural, you can learn how to be a, a gifted minister. You cannot, saints of God. It's a gift of God that has to work in a man's life and I will admit that some men have a hard time locating their gifts, uh, especially through this restoration that we've worked our way through. But time is coming that it'll be easier. In fact, apostles will be able to help you understand what your gift is. Their gift reaches out. You know, just remember this. If that's the five-fold ministry, that thumb can touch every gift there is. That thumb covers them all. In fact... In the early church, that thumb was the authority over all other gifts. That didn't mean he was a dictator. He was a man that loved God, and he could recognize a gift, and he could let that gift work and rejoice in the fact. It's like he was a, it's like, I sometimes say it this way, it's like he was a general practitioner, doctor, and these other guys were specialists, and he could send those specialists out to meet your needs and help you. I know it's a little different way of looking at it, but um, anyway, so uh, this this ministry uh, down through the the dark ages of the Gentiles is a developing ministry that's continuing to develop until we get to a restored church. Let me go a little bit further. <clears throat> it says Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory, of, of the glory of God, and the express image of his person. See, Jesus was not his father. He just, this, the Godhead is this simple. A son can't be his own daddy, and a daddy can't be his own son. God's not an author of confusion. He didn't talk about his son and it being him. He was the father and his son was his son. And he didn't talk about his son being the father and his son the same one. God don't confuse things like he's not the author of confusion. It's just simple. God, Jesus was the express image, just like any son. If I had the ability to raise my son with all the wisdom that God had to raise Jesus, my son would be just like me. He could say to you, just like Jesus did, when you've seen me, you've seen my father. Because I'm just like him. He, he planted everything that's in him in me. 
and he had the wisdom to do it. Uh, I, I don't have that wisdom, and I wasn't able to plant that exact. However, I will say this about my son. He didn't fall too far from the tree. You know, he's got a lot of my traits. I asked my wife the other day, I was looking in the mirror. I looked in the mirror a certain way. I said, you see that look right there? I said, that's exactly what my daddy looked like. He looked exactly. I see myself in him more and more every day. I know I'm not exactly like him, but I've got a lot of my dad in me. Anyway, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins here on this earth, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, which was his father being made so much better than the angels as he hath by, an, by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. He was better than the angels. He created the angels. God created him and he created everything else that was created. Read Colossians, uh, the Colossians, the second chapter. It says right here in, in that first by whom also he made the worlds, hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son. God hath in these last days spoken unto us. By his Son who hath appointed uh, heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Jesus was better than the angels. Not, He's not saying, you know, I'm better than you. What he's saying is, is he was the Son of God. He wasn't, the helpers of God in angelic form. He was God's only son that God created. And by his name, being the son of God, he had a more, he had a more excellent name than they. For under which of us of the angels said he at any time, see he's, he's quoting, the writer of Hebrews is quoting now from the book of Psalms, Psalms 2, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, in another place, he said, I will be to him a father and he'll be to me a son. And again, in another place, verse 6 says, He bringeth in the first begotten into the world, and he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. And the, of the angels, he said, Who makes the angels spirits? And his ministers a flame of fire. But in the son... He saith, thy throne, O God. See, God calls him a God because he is a God. He is a, he's deity. He's the son of God. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness. Is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, Jesus, your God, even the Father, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness. That's understanding. Oil in the lamp, it's not, it's not light until it's, until it's ignited. But that oil, see, your understanding, your knowledge, your knowledge is in, it's in, in that oil when it's ignited or touched by the Spirit of God, it becomes light. It becomes understanding. So oil is knowledge. And when it's ignited by the Spirit of God, it becomes wisdom. Uh, he said he's anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows because he had understanding of God above all other men. No other man was born of God. Jesus was the only man on earth at that time that was born of God. Everyone else was born of Adam. That's why Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. And thou, Lord, in the, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the works of thy hands. See, again, he's showing you made the heaven and the earth. It, you know, principles, uh, powers, and principalities, 
things in heaven and in earth. God, Jesus created all of that. God told him to. God gave him the authority to do it. He created man. Thou shalt perish, but uh, they shall perish, but thou remainest. And they all shall wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Jesus wouldn't die of an old, he wouldn't die of old age. We know he was crucified and was in the grave three days, but he resurrected unto life, and he's living forevermore. And he said that. He said, I'm him that was dead and am alive and will live forevermore. But to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to them who shall be heirs of salvation? So angels were ministering spirits that would minister to everyone that shall be heirs of salvation. Jesus, though, would sit at the right hand of God until he made all enemies. By the way, you and I was an enemy at God at, at some time before before we were born again, we, we were of the flesh, fleshy, fleshly, full of lust of the eyes, the pride of life, lust of the flesh, and we're all enemies of God. We, we couldn't please God in any way. But today, we're not God's enemies. We've been born again. We're God's children and friends. We're becoming friends of God. And finally, we're to become a son of God. Remember what John said? He said, uh, we, he said, what manner of love hath the Father bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God? And we know not what we shall be. This is 1 John 3. But we shall be like him when he appears. I tell people all the time, that's not talking about when Jesus, if Jesus appeared today, it wouldn't make you like him. He's going to appear in the church, in a restored church. He's going to appear and he's going to help us be developed in being fully his workmanship until we become a full age and he appears in our lives we'll be like him when he gets finished with his work in all of us don't get discouraged today Just, you have to learn how to be content with where you're at in God knowing that I, I am in a growing state and God will not allow me to stay where I'm at have you ever felt it I know you have if you're God's child. You may live and be where you're at for some time. And then all of a sudden, the Lord begins to shake you up. And the Lord says, I want you to move up a little. I want you to move up another step, another grade, another development. I'm not going to allow you to stay where you was. I'm going to require more out of you. To him who much is given, much is required. God's going to give you more, and he's going to require more of you. I was talking to you about judgment earlier. God's first judgment is informative judgment. He first gives you information, then he requires you to do something with that information. Yeah, it's instructive. It's instructive information. It's information. Then it, 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 it can be first just information. Then God starts giving you instruction with that information. And he requires it out of you to answer the instruction. And if you don't answer it, then the judgment can become corrective. God chastises those whom he loves. It, it, it's not just corrective. It can be chastisement. It can be punishment. If God loves you, he chastises who he loves. A father that won't discipline his child I raised, you know, a lot of you, I'm sure, do know that I raised standard poodles 
you know, and I have been raising them for over 20 years. I tell people all the time, if you're the kind of person that don't believe in disciplining a child, you have no business with a dog. Dogs, pets have to be disciplined, trained and disciplined just like human beings have to be. You can spoil them just like you can spoil a child. And, you know, if you, if you don't discipline your child, you don't love it. You know, people, people that don't face responsibilities in life, you know, this, is, this, is, this world, this United States is getting to be a corrupt nation. Even though I can talk on the good side, it's still the greatest nation in the world but there's so much corruption taking place in this world. Big part of it is because there's only a handful of people that are trying to take over and take charge because people don't want to be responsible anymore. That's why people will let somebody else be, be in charge and run everything. You know, that's why people like to hear this message our politicians are giving us about socialism. You know, we're big government, we take care of the people. Well, what they're really telling you is, is we're gonna run your life for you. We're gonna take care of you. But we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna tell you how much money you can make, we're gonna tell you what kind of living you can live, and when that government becomes, when it's all government and they govern everything, you know, more government, more government, more government, before long there's no freedom. And then it becomes the rich and the poor. And you, you may think, you know, when there's, you, you can think of all these benefits that you get free of charge with no responsibility. There's people all the time suing insurance companies Ain't nothing wrong with them. They're suing them anyway because they want to get big money. Well, if you owned the business and you were having to pay the high insurance rates, you wouldn't be suing anybody because you'd understand the other end of it. See, but people don't want to face responsibility. Just give me, give me, give me. I'm a taker. I'm just going to take, but I don't want to face any responsibility. People don't like to hear that. They hate men who say what I just got through saying. I'm not going to be popular for saying it. It doesn't matter. It's the truth about life. God is not going to have anybody in his kingdom that won't face responsibility. You're going to answer for the deeds that are in your life. If you take advantage of others, you're going to answer for that. If you take advantage on your job, you're going to answer for it. You will reap what you sow. So, uh, you know, I won't, I won't say any more about that, but uh, but it, it needs some of those things need to be said from time to time. We have to be responsible for God and God's judgments progressive. God's taking us along, informing us, instructing us, correcting us as needed be. That's why we all need to learn to say, I'd rather do what's righteous, what I've been instructed to do, than I had to be corrected or even chastised because God loves me and he's, he wants to whip me, to ch correct me because he loves me and he don't want me to get by with not living the way I should live and not being responsible the way I should be. And so the Lord is, he's full of mercy. He's full of grace and God, he's, he's slow to even speak, he's slow to wrath. But that doesn't, you know, if you read, let me read you a scripture, and I believe it's in the first Chronicles is where I'll read. Boy, I may not be too popular tonight with this message. I want y'all to know I love you. <laughs> I'm going to Chronicles, First Chronicles, and I believe it's in the tenth. I'm going to go to the tenth chapter. I 
Let's read the last verse. I know most of you know Saul was killed, but let's read, let's read what, what happened to him, what was said about him when he died. 13th verse, 1 Chronicles 10. So Saul died for his transgressions, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit, remember the witch of Endor, to inquire of it. Now look what it says in the last verse, 14. And inquired not of the Lord, therefore he, God, slew him and turned the kingdom unto David, the son of Jesse. This is the man that built the temple in Jerusalem. This is the man that had wisdom to write the book of Proverbs, the Songs of Solomon. This is the man that had more wisdom that failed God in the end, and God slew him. See, God loves his people, but we will answer God for all of our deeds. Now, just remember this. When I said that, all of your sinful deeds that's repented of and God has put them in the sea of forgetfulness, you won't have to answer for that. I'll tell you what you will have to do, though. You will have to correct whatever's in your life that caused you to do those things. God will require it of you. He's not going to let you keep just sinning and repenting, sinning and repenting. He wants you to get out of the sinning business. Remember what he said here in Hebrews in uh, the fifth chapter and the 12th verse. It says, for many, for when, for the time, you ought to be teachers. You have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So you can be a babe in Christ, and then all the way to full growth is, the writer here calls it a full age. Discerning, having a discernment of wisdom, of knowing right from wrong in everything. He says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Leaving the principles. What are those principles? Let's look what he says. Not laying, again, the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith towards God, Back there, those Hebrews, dead works was the law, the rituals of the law, not continuing to sin and offer sacrifice, sin and offer sacrifice. To a Gentile, sin and repent, sin and repent. Keep sinning and keep repenting. You gotta, you gotta go beyond that. He don't mean leave it. You don't have to worry about that anymore. He means we've got to go beyond the foundation of faith and, and uh, repentance from dead works and faith towards God. See, we've got faith. We had faith to repent. We had faith to, to, to offer our life as a sacrifice. But we've got to get to a place that we're not continuing to do the things. See, some people think, I can't grow in God. I never reach perfection. Why does it say, therefore, go on to perfection if you can't do it? God wouldn't tell you to do something you couldn't do. You can't do it without God's help. But here's how you do it. You quit laying this foundation. You continue to grow and develop unto a greater age than a baby. Of the doctrine of baptisms, those are principles. These are principles, understanding Water baptism. Somebody asked me today, a preacher asked me, said, should, if I've got a saint that has lived as a saint, they've been baptized, but I'm having a baptism service and they want to be rebaptized, should I let them be baptized? I said, yes, let them be rebaptized. 
Peter said that it's an answer of a good conscience towards God, not putting away the filth of the flesh, but it's a good answer to the conscience. In other words, when you repent and you baptize, you're baptized, that water baptism is a picture. Here, is, here I'm publicly making a confession and a profession that when this preacher buries me, that's what baptism means, buries me in water, that's a picture that I have decided and I proclaim that I'm dying out to this old sinful flesh that I've lived in my life. And when I come up out of that water, I'm coming up in a new birth. That's a picture of Holy Ghost baptism. Hadn't took place yet, but that's, that's what is to take place. It, right behind water baptism. I had a sister in my church who lived for God and been in the church all her life. One day she asked me, she said, Brother Smith, I know I was baptized in the body of Christ. I know that my baptism's good, but I didn't understand it when I was baptized. And I just like to be baptized I, because I understand it. Now I want the Lord to know I understand my proclamation. I just like that experience with the understanding and just rededicate myself to the Lord. I said, get on your baptism clothes and get ready to be baptized. It is an answer of a good conscience. You said, Brother Smith, did she have to do it? No, I don't think she did. But it answered her conscience, her desire to show the Lord her willingness and her knowledge of what beautiful thing water baptism is in repentance. It seals your repentance. It makes a public proclamation. I'm proclaiming that I'm going to live for God. I made a decision. And then Holy Ghost baptism, of course. Those are baptism, baptism of fire. We're, we all have to go through a baptism of fire, trials and temptations, heat, going through persecutions. We haven't suffered Saints, nothing like the early church had to suffer or nothing like the restored church in, a, in the end of the Gentile work world will have to suffer persecutions that will be great. I'm telling you, we've got a government in this whole world that will not tolerate anybody that, that whose life condemns them for their unrighteousness. You live a righteous life, you're gonna suffer persecution especially before a government, a worldly government that's going to become a one world people under a beast power, a dragon power. You're not going to condemn them and get by with it. Jesus didn't. They crucified him over it. They crucified his, his apostles over it. And I know that doesn't sound good, but let me just tell you this. The power of God. Jesus, you remember what he said? He said, I have bread to eat that you know not of. He told his disciples. He understood. Oh, God, help us to understand. Help us to get enough of God in our life that nothing in this world, persecution or death, could separate us. Like Paul said, nothing can separate me from the love of God. God, help us. So he's saying you, you have to not lay down again the foundation of, of, of the doctrine of baptism, the doctrine of laying on the hands. That's a ministry. Laying on the hands is not a man just walking up and putting his hand on and pray for you. It's a, the, the hand of God, apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, and evangelists. God's ministry, the hand of God being over your life. You have to learn how to submit your life to those that have rule over you the ministry of God. You, you need to, to, to know how to voluntarily submit your life to a ministry, not a dictatorial ministry, not a kingship, a loving servant of God that serves you the truth of God's word and they're afraid to serve you anything else but what God would have for you. That's the kind of ministry God's developing and the kind of ministry we'll have to have for a restored church. 
is still, we've got the answer to somebody. We may not answer directly to God, but we'll have to answer to a ministry. Children have to answer to mama. Mama have to answer to her husband. The husband has to answer to his pastor. The pastor has to answer to chief leaders in the body of Jesus Christ, which eventually will be chief apostles, just like the early church did. And those apostles have to answer to Jesus Christ and they better treat his saints good the way he wants them treated. The men that will give their life for the people of God. Anyway, so we have to, the laying on of hands is that ministry, the hand of God covering your life, protecting you, giving you instruction, and sometimes even correction to keep the wiles of the devil off of you. Laying not again the foundation of the resurrection of the dead, knowing and understanding the resurrections, to be born of God's spirit, dying out to the old Adamic nature, being born again or made alive through the birth of the spirit, and then the resurrection to the natural body. If you don't make the bride, if the harvest isn't in your time of life, there'll be a resurrection. We need to understand that. We need to have a hope in that. And eternal judgment. See, there is an eternal judgment. I don't think there's very many people that's been eternally judged. I'm not talking about the ungodly. They're, they're, they're eternally judged because they're not worthy even to stand in God's judgment. But I'm talking about people, the people of God. God's not going to judge his people until there is a full manifestation of God's words, in the word of God and the spirit of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, it's just good this evening to be with you. I uh, wanted to say some things more in the book of Hebrews about Jesus being he was made better than the angels in that first verse. In the second verse, it, listen to this, verse 9, the second chapter, it says, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. He was made lower than the angels because angels don't die. Angels can't die. Luke 20. Let's look at Luke 20, 36. I'm going to close. Y'all, you know, y'all must be great people to talk to because you inspire me. Let me see what Jesus said here in Luke, the 20th chapter. They ask him a question, you know. is asking about, you know, man's man died and his, another took his wife and then another took his wife. Who's, well, who's, who's wife is she going to be in the resurrection, they ask. Jesus answering, saying unto them, verse 34, Luke 20, 34, the children of this life, this world, marry and are given in marriage, but they which are accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. Ne uh, neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. They, they don't die anymore because they're equal to angels. Angels can't die. Jesus was made lower than the angels in that state because he took on the form of man, became a human, so he'd be a high priest and a true mediator that understood you and I and what we go through in this life. And he had to overcome sin just like you and I. He was tempted in every point. Read the second chapter of Hebrews and the fourth chapter, and it's clear about that. Anyway... What a Savior we're serving. What a great God. What a great, great message is the Word of God. It's so, so 
detail is so big. God just has to keep helping us to get more and more of it. God bless your hearts. I love you all. I want to thank all of you people that have sent us some offerings for the Dominican Republic. The Dominican Republic suffering. There's several people over there out of work. They, some don't have any food. We've sent a lot of money recently uh, to try uh, and give them some some rice and beans money to help feed the poor over there that are in need. Thank you so much for your offerings, and we still are in need. I just had a pastor call me the other day. He said, Brother Smith, I need to tell you, I've got saints in my church that are in need. They don't have any food. I, I don't have any money to help them. I sent him an offering, but I certainly didn't send him near as much as I'd like to have because... But I said, here's a little money to help them with some rice and beans, and I'll send you more when I, when I can. I'm talking about men that I know. I know that they are not taking advantage of the money of, from God's people. I know these men. I know them from the heart, and I know that, that they, you give them the money, and they'll see to it that they, they give it to the people. I trust the men of God that are working with me over in the Dominican Republic. <clears throat> Thank you, you men from the Dominican that are listening tonight. I, I honor you in a great way and I appreciate the work that you're doing over there. And we're trying to help your people. God bless your heart. Uh, Sister Lois Estrada, she has a special unspoken request for her son and his family. Please, Brother Jimmy has cancer and they're going to be traveling tomorrow. Uh, and so please pray for Sister Estrada's son that has cancer. Pray for Brother Shelby Weaver. He's in the hospital on life support. He certainly needs our prayers. God bless your hearts. If you didn't, weren't able to see the whole uh, message here tonight, it will be, it's posted. As soon as I close, you can go back and watch the whole thing again on this page. God bless your hearts. Uh, Brother Painter will also post it on the our website, uh, Gospel Assembly of Little Rock uh, Church. Uh, I think it's called gospelassembly.com. gospelassemblychurch.com, that's it. God bless your hearts. I love all of you. Pray for me, and I'll pray for you. Pray for my wife. She hasn't felt good today. She's had a little something that, uh, you know, that she's uh, had a problem today and, and not feeling well at all. So please pray for Sister Smith. God bless your hearts. Pray for Sister Ann McGowan. She's recovering from surgery. And Brother McGowan. Pray for the people of God in the body of Jesus Christ all over the world. We love you all. Have a good night. God bless you.